move on to our next panel now, which is um, the technical term. So there are certain areas of um, Laudoc of that the technical term we have for these are a rabble. Um, authenticity is one of them. Um, we could discuss authenticity all day and never finish that discussion. Uh, privacy is one of the most important issues that we have to deal with as we're looking at these legacy databases. Right? You can require lawyers not to put in social security numbers and you can find them and you can shame them and you can have all sorts of rules and maybe going forward you can fix those kinds of things. But even if you're simply fixing things going forward, you have these legacy databases and in the law it's a precedential system, you need the archive. Um, and as Tim O'Reilly alluded, uh, when I put the, the uh, congressional record, I made a copy from the GPO site and I put it on the internet. And lo and behold, there were 500,000 social security numbers in the congressional record published by the United States Senate. Um, so these privacy issues are not just in court documents. They're not just some, some bankruptcy lawyer who doesn't care about his clients. Uh, this is a problem you're going to find at the local level, at the county level, at the state level, and, and in, in tons of federal um, types of databases. So I'm, I'm really pleased that we've got two of the leading experts in this field. Um, Chris uh, used to work at Epic, was the, um, at Epic, one of the leading electronic privacy information center, um, has really carried the torch for privacy in the electronic age for ages. Um, he is now on the faculty of the University of California. Uh, Peter Wynn is a deputy um, uh, um, um, attorney, uh, uh, what's your official title? Assistant attorney, assistant U.S. attorney. Uh, an assistant U.S. attorney. Um, in the Department of Justice and has been a prolific speaker on privacy issues for, for quite a while, has quite a few scholarly papers on, on the issue. And so I'm going to turn it over to you folks um, and we have about 50 minutes for this session. So. Okay. You want to go first? Yeah. Uh, Carl and I are holding down the, we're wearing a suit and tie just to show that suit and ties still exist. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got it. Um, I, before I start, I need to say the usual disclaimer that the, the, the views that you're going to hear are not the official position of the United States Department of Justice. <laughs> um, I think that would be obvious anyway. Um, you know, I, about, um, I teach a privacy law class at the University of Washington um, and have done so for some time. And partly because I taught that class uh, several years ago, I was asked to, to write a paper about privacy and the problem of access to court records. About the time when court records were starting to go online in, the, in just 2002, 2003 period of time. And so I wrote the article and, and forgot about it. And then um, a couple of years later, Tom Bruce, who is with the Legal Information Institute at Cornell, um, some of whom probably many of you know it, just stumbled across the article. Peter Martin stumbled over it and thought that I ought to be encouraged to do more. And then um, folks at the Department of Justice found out that I was doing more, and I did more. <laughs> so um, I'll be um, on, I'm taking a detail from, the, from Seattle to Washington to, to work in called the Office of Legal Counsel on these issues. Uh, sort of, you're Tigger, you're the only one, so if you don't have to be good, you have to be there. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess the, the point I want to make today is how difficult and complicated the problem is. Um, okay, we want court records to be open, we want court records to be transparent. As we know, that's important for the political feedback loop. It's important for the legitimacy of the system, not only that, that things, um, I mean, that be, it has to be perceived as fair, not just be fair for the, for the system to work. Um, it's important, by the way, that, that this, this stuff, which is the resolution of disputes, take place in a public forum. And the reason it's important that it take place in, in a public forum, because if it doesn't, people are tending, will tend to use self-help. I mean, even before we had what we call a rational judicial system, you know, where we work with rules and laws and the application of law to fact, 
even when we had uh, rituals, ordeals, as a means of resolving disputes, it had to be in public because the point of a judicial system is that it's a nonviolent way of resolving disputes. The alternative is self-help. Okay, and that's always the case, and that's why it has to be public. So this stuff has to be in public for a lot of really good reasons. At the same time, there's a lot of sensitive information that goes into the, into the judicial system. Um, you know, and, and the sensitive information is critical for the truth-finding function of the judicial system. You know, people um, believe, and uh, participants in the judicial system are not simply the parties. We're talking about jurors, you know, we're talking about witnesses, we're talking about a lot of third parties who are, whose information gets into the judicial system, many of, and, and, and it's not simply individuals. You know, we have businesses whose information gets into the judicial system in terms of trade secrets or confidential business um, information. And we have governments, believe it or not, that um, are sitting on a lot of sensitive information, mostly pertaining to businesses and individuals. In tax returns is a good example, but there's a 101 other examples of government sitting on a lot of sensitive information. Uh, a lot of that information will get into the judicial dispute resolution process. In addition, governments have their own special secrets, like, you know, the secret, form the secret formula for making atomic bombs. And, and, and sometimes that gets into uh, a, a judicial dispute resolution process. So, um, you're, and, and what's really amazing about the system that we have is people are, generally speaking, voluntarily submitting that sensitive information to this judicial resu you know, resolution process, and they're doing it without having to be thrown in, thrown in jail and forced to turn it over. They're doing it voluntarily. So there, there's a level of comfort that people have that when they submit sensitive information into this system, it's not going to bite them in the butt. Okay, so it, the basic problem that we have is um, we want a transparent system that protects sensitive information. Okay? We want to have our cake. We want to eat it too. Okay, now... In order to understand, before you, before you sort of look at the nightmare of, of electronic information, you, you need to take a second and look at the world of paper. Um, the wonderful thing about paper is it's hard to work with. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's practically obscure is the, is the magic word. Um, and, and, you know, in the, in the paper days, you could periodically get a document sealed. Um, about maybe less than 1% of documents in the paper-based system was sealed. The rest of the stuff might as well have been sealed because nobody could get hold of it without standing in line at the courthouse. You know, you, you finally get in line and, and you finally find the right file and you finally find what you want to look at. And, and the clerk says, well, the judge has it in his chambers. You can't see it. <laughs> This is, I mean, generationally, that's the way it was when I, would, I graduated from law school in the 80s. Okay, so it goes online, and, and um, by the way, the, the problems now, as we, as we are about to, to jump into an online system, the problems have, the, have, people have experienced these problems in the past. I mean, there was a time when court records weren't on paper. Court, Courts were basically oral institutions where people basically argued in the community, and what was argued, it was argued, and, and that was that. And as soon as people started putting stuff on paper in the court system back in the 13th century when they invented rag paper and people became moderately more literate, the, the reaction of the judicial system was shut it down. Nobody had access to the paper. And 800 years later, we've kind of worked out this balance. The reason why I want to use that as an example is I think 800 years from now, we'll probably have the balance right. <laughs> but in the meantime, we're, we're just at the beginning of a fairly dramatic transformation in how this information is managed. Okay, now, I've spent a lot of time working in the federal judicial system. 
both as a, as a lawyer as well as working with the Judicial Conference, because they too, when they found out that I was like interested in this issue and you're Tigger, suddenly you know, you're helping them, whether you like it or not. You know, an Article III judge calls you up and asks you to help you, you don't, you don't say no. So, um, but the thing about the federal system, before I start talking about the federal system, is the, and this is definitely not the position of the Department of Justice. <laughs> <laughs> the federal system is kind of a boutique. You know, it's sort of, it, it's, 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 I mean, a good example is, in, I mean, I work in Seattle. We do a, less than a thousand dispositions a year. I mean, you go over to King County, which is a smaller district. When we got half the state, they just have a single county, they're doing 50,000 cases a year, okay? So this gives you an idea about just how um, representative this sample is, okay? Also, the federal courts don't do divorces, you know, where you really, and you don't do juvenile cases. I mean, we would do one juvenile case in, a, in, in, in 2000. Um, and so, we're dealing with something that's a lot easier to manage than, than the states who are dealing with people who really are not at their best. And by the way, the other thing about the state system, I mean, Colorado is a good example. 85% of divorces in Colorado are pro se. So they don't even have lawyers. And a lot of the, a lot of the cases that go through the state system do not have lawyers, they certainly don't have lawyers that dress really well, you know, and, 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 and no site, you know, site formation or clerks for judges. I mean, you're dealing, even when they do have lawyers, you're dealing with a different class. And you're dealing with people who aren't, you know, doing double backflips and half twists on the back letter law. All right, so federal system. Um, the federal system had the benefit of being the guinea pig. It jumped into the deep end of the swimming pool before, largely because nobody knew what they were doing. <laughs> and so they went to the PACER system, and or it's called PACER or ECF. Um, court, it's a system where lawyers can file their own pleadings. They, they basically disappeared the people in the clerk's office who used to take care of that for you, but who also used to call you up when you file a pleading with social security numbers on it and say, Mr. Wynn, did you intend to file, you know, this pleading with this big list of social security numbers of your of patients who are the subject of your lot of your enforcement proceeding? I said, no, I didn't. And you know, you would be in the clerk's office the next day or that that afternoon, you know, substituting. The clerk would let you substitute the paper, and boy, you would ever be nice to that clerk. And come Thanksgiving or Christmas, they would always be getting something special because they had your back. Well, the PACER system doesn't have your back, okay? The, the, the electronic system is not forgiving. And this is a, this is, this is a problem in both, two, in two senses. One is, um, um, well, one is we do a pretty, excuse my French, we do a pretty shitty job of getting the information out to the public in a way that's useful. Okay, I mean, this is, this is um, most of what today has been talking about is just how frustrating it is to get access to the actual court decisions or the briefs of the parties, the stuff that is legitimately a matter of public concern. They do a really bad job because the PACER system um, is, is not Google searchable. You have to have a credit card to get access and even to get at, even if the opinions are free, um, you're going to be charged for the search. So, so there's a lot of dysfunctional aspects about the PACER system, but the PACER system, to some extent, is still kind of sort of practically obscure. Kind of sort of. Um, uh, the other problem, of course, is that um, it does a really lousy job of identifying the sensitive information and targeting it so it can be protected, all right? Um, I mean, Carl is famous because he, he's really popular with the judges, let me tell you. Because he, he, he I think he got 20% of the PACER system on a, on a, a, a sort of uh, controversial 
uh, <laughs> process where a lot of this stuff was downloaded from a public site. Um, and then he searched, he, he did an audit. Heaven forbid that anyone would audit the system. But the audit showed that there are a lot of lawyers who basically were brain dead like me who were filing social security numbers and pleadings even though there was a rule that said thou shalt not do that, okay? And it, it, it hit the radar screen of the judges when it was on the New York Times. <laughs> um, and um, I let, three weeks ago, I basically gave a talk to the judges. Um, the judicial conference had a sort of, con they convened a bunch of committees uh, to, to, to address the issue of are we doing this as well as we can, all right? So even though there are a bunch of, actually they're not all white guys, you know, who are over 60. Um, some of them are white women who are over 60. <laughs> um, well, and I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but there, there are, but, they, but one of the things federal judges are comfortable doing is, is, you know, they're not the sort of person you're going to call up and lean on. <laughs> right? that, that's bad, bad idea. So when you get an issue teed up before them, they will make a rational decision. They are used to making decisions, and they are pretty good at making reasonably fair, articulate decisions. Um, you may or may not agree with, but they, they're comfortable in that role. So they're in the process of trying to decide whether they can do this better or not. Um, now, um, there are various strategies that we can adopt when we try to design a better system. One is we can Keep the system, keep the information out of the system to start with, right? Don't put social security numbers in your pleadings. Redact them if you have to, okay? Um, the, there's a second strategy, which is, you know, of course, that's just like the old paper system. There's a second strategy as well, which is um, uh, seal it. Just lock it out entirely file it, but nobody can have access to it but the parties, right? There's a third strategy. A third strategy is allow anybody to file what they want to in the system, but make everybody promise when they access the information to only use it for the purposes having to do with the administration of justice. The idea is, it's like the, I mean, uh, Joel Reidenberg likes this idea, which is, Basically, yeah, it's, 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 it's given to the court for one purpose, but if somebody takes this information and uses it for a secondary purpose uh, to embarrass somebody, I mean, if I want to look at my neighbor's divorce records because I'm just curious, then I'm somehow violating their rights. Um, th that, is, that is a general idea that, is, um, that I, I, I think we probably can have a productive conversation about it, Chris and I, and, Carl and a lot of people. I actually proposed that idea in, in an article that I wrote there in the back. It's free for anybody who wants to swipe one of those paper copies. And I'm, I'm sort of leaning right now and deciding that what I said in the article last year was just stupid <laughs> because I'm not sure it works. Uh, I mean, from a practical point of view as well as from a legal point of view, there's a lot of issues. Um, the, the fourth strategy is um, is a sort of intermediate strategy that I proposed. It's actually been adopted by the judges, believe it or not, in the new federal rules of procedure, and that federal rules of procedure are criminal procedure, civil procedure, uh, bankruptcy procedure, and appellate procedure. And all those four sets of federal rules have adopted this idea, which is for a cause, which is a much lower standard than for a compelling reason, which is the standard for sealing the document. For cause just means you have to have a good reason. You can basically file something offline, and you can get a judge's order to let you do it. The, that is the standard way in which Social Security and administration, I'm sorry, Social Security and immigration cases are, are filed today. They're, particularly the, the administrative file, or the, the, the under, these are appeals from the agency that has basically said grace over somebody who says they're, they're, so, si they're so sick or they're so hurt so bad they can't work, for instance, in the Social Security context. The whole file is health records. 
And so the court said, these people don't have those kinds of resources to, to go through and redact every other page or every page. Um, we're just not gonna, we're just gonna file it offline. And that's actually worked relatively well since, um, I mean, I don't know how long that will work well, but, but th it's an option right now that you can just sort of have this intermediate level where you sort of reproduce practical obscurity by simply taking the document and filing it in a way where it's only accessible in an electronic form to the parties in the court. I don't know how that's going to work because the rule is so damn obscure, nobody's tried it. <laughs> um, but, but maybe lawyers will try it and we'll, we'll see whether this operates as sort of a stopgap measure. I'm not sure. So these, these four, there are four strategies. Um, the problem, there are, within those four strategies, there are three techniques, there are three tools in our toolbox. One are rules. And, and the judges and the lawyers are really good at making rules. And rules, you know, you, you, you sort of have this idea that thou shalt not follow social security number, and that's the rule. You pass the rule, and you put it in the rule, in, in the civil rules, and everyone's supposed to adhere to it. Um, you can have um, better training. So, the, so the, the folks who are using the system are better trained to use it so they don't, you know, trip off, you know. Like, let's take those 60-year-old white guys who, who are used to working in paper, and let's make them, before they're gonna get a paper account, have some training. Like, let's license them, give, make, make a driver's license before we give them a license to drive a car, right? <laughs> so that's the second technique. We can do a lot better training the lawyers. We can do a lot better training the judges, most of whom don't file their own case pleadings. They have their secretaries do it. Uh, the, the third area is technology. And technology, better technology can help, okay? And better understanding of the technology can help. Uh, PACER system, is an appalling technology right now. Um, the ECF, you know, the electronic filing system is really a very, very, very cumbersome, not useful system. Ten years ago, it was, it was, it was the greatest thing since sliced bread, okay? There are technologies that can help identify sensitive information that can be better used. There's just a, I mean, I, I'm, you know, in San Francisco, I'm like preaching to the choir on that. So, um, but the judges who are on the judicial conference in the federal system, I mean, three weeks ago, I had to lobby to get Ed Felton to come and talk to them. And, and it was like their jaws were dropping when Ed was talking because he was making stuff so clear and so easy in terms of what the technology can and can't do. So these people are trying to do the right thing. They just don't understand the technology, okay? Lawyers generally are typically not technologically literate, at least not in my generation. The younger generation of lawyers tend to be. So that's going to ultimately get better if more of us die off. Um, so, so we have, um, we've got those three techniques. But, but what I'm actually arguing, and, and I've argued a lot, is that those techniques alone are not going to be enough. Um, the, the, to, be, to some extent, we have to have sort of a reconceptualization of what we're doing here. Um, I, I, in the article, I talk about this adversary system because the judges are used to resolving things when people are in fights, right? The whole point of the process is to resolve fights, so laws and rules get worked out in the context of, of resolving fights. What if nobody's fighting? What if a lawyer's going to court and have an agreed order to seal a settlement, even though it's a mass tort that's a matter of legitimate public concern? Well, the judge is gonna sign that order nine times out of 10. Seattle Times has gone through and done audits, which are now available because the stuff is online, um, of the number of times sealing orders were entered in compliance with the, 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 the rules of sealing, which are fairly stringent. 97% of the time they didn't comply with the rules. Why? Because nobody was fighting. <laughs> If nobody fights, the judge signs the order. You don't have to comply with the law. You're agreed. The law is there to resolve disputes. So that's the same thing happens at the privacy side. That's a violation of the public's right to access. The same thing gets, happens when the lawyers aren't representing the person whose private information is at stake. 
You think they're going to be focused on that? No, they aren't. And in fact, when they did the audit, when, they, when the judicial conference went through and looked at what Carl had already done in terms of the Social Security numbers, a majority of those cases involved people who weren't being represented. The socials were people who weren't being represented. Okay? That's obvious, right? If the system is there to resolve disputes, the people who aren't represented are going to be left in the, in the, in the lurch, right? So what, what, we're, what are we really dealing with here? We're dealing with what ec economists call externalities, pollution, right? And in the 19th century, we used nuisance doctrine to resolve pollution issues. We didn't, it, it worked just fine in the 18th century. In the 19th century, with industrialization, it stopped working so fine. In the 20th century, we set up administrative agencies to manage externalities caused by people who pollute, right? Sometimes you want to let people pollute, and sometimes you don't. It depends on a cost-benefit analysis, and somebody's got to focus, and now we have things called it, you know, uh, you know, NEPA, and you, you do environmental impact statements, and you basically, the, 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 the bottom line is you put everybody in the room before you make a significant decision about, like, how we manage information. And you put everybody in the room, you get everybody with, to, to like, try to identify who's going to get hurt when we do this, and, and, and you muddle through. That's what the states have been doing, by the way. They watch the federal federal system kind of jump into the swimming pool and start drowning, and, and they, they thought, well, maybe we should try to get all the stakeholders together in the room put them, and, and let them talk. And, and Colorado just did that. And one of the things they did when they put everybody in the room is they stopped using paper. I mean, they stopped using the model of a document on paper and instead started inputting the information separately so it could be managed more easily. That's the state where 85% of the people don't have lawyers, maybe because they decide they don't need them. Um, so so that's, that's something that I think the federal, you know, the federal government was sort of being watched by everybody, but the states who really do have a much, much, much more difficult set of problems to solve here are, 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 are learning and they're talking to one another. And there is a dialogue going on. Um, when you try to get the rules right, and you try to get the technology right, and you try to get the training programs right, it's contentious, okay? People fight, but that's okay. And at the end of the day, you get a better result when you get all that stuff on the table at the front end rather than the back end. The um, one, I wanna, there's sort of one last issue just to talk about how important it is to get it right. And it's just an example. Um, the rules of evidence, like, you know, if, if I'm a prosecutor and we run a search warrant without, or we don't have a search warrant, we just run a search without a warrant of a guy's house and we find a ton of, of say, cocaine in there. All right? No exigent circumstances, we just suspected the guy was a drug dealer. He files a motion to suppress and it's gonna get granted. The jury is not supposed to know about the fact that we went into the guy's house, we found a ton of cocaine. It has to do with the notion of due process. It has to do with Fourth Amendment rights. It has to do with a lot of questions about who we are as people, right? We'd rather have a guilty person go free if it involves the government pushing somebody around in a way that violates their rights. Well, you know, juries, you know, they don't want to send this drug dealer out on the street again. A jury can now Google the motion to suppress if we put it online. Juries, by the way, are Googling defendants' prior criminal records because it's online. Let me tell you something. A jury that knows that this is, this is information as a prosecutor, I'll lose my bar card if I, if I point out to the jury the guy has, has been convicted of a crime, particularly one very similar to the one I'm prosecuting him for. You know, I, it's, I wait for him to get up on the stand and then I pop the champagne course, then I can use it to impeach him, but otherwise I can't, right? Everybody knows this rule, but the jury doesn't, doesn't care because they can find out that the guy has been convicted of exactly the same crime that he's being prosecuted for, right? And they don't have to tell me. Now, jurors have always been told, don't read the newspapers, and we all know that jurors read the newspapers. But the jurors know the case better than the newspaper reporter, so they laugh. 
But juries are not supposed to know about stuff that's true, like the fact that we did find a ton of cocaine in the guy's house. There's a due process issue here if we get it wrong. Courts are information management machines. That's what they do. They manage information to, to, to direct the power of the government um, and issue these judgments. So these are allows you to go and take the person's property or take their liberty or take their life. Knowledge is power. Information is power. And judges know that instinctively. And so it's important to get this balance right because it affects a lot of different things. Jeremy Bentham in the 18th century, late 18th century, early 19th century, argued strongly that the rules of evidence should be gotten rid of. This notion of, of the exclusionary rule was anathema to him because he figured juror, the goal was to get the truth, right? Not to be, this fairness idea, this idea of rights, he made fun of. But, you know, and we can go to a Benthamite panopticon in the law. We can simply say we're just going to get the truth and, and we don't care. But, but there, are, there are deep, deep issues about who we are as a people which are going to be implicated when we are no longer able to manage information, to keep sensitive information away from certain people like jurors, or to prevent anybody, I mean, to, to allow individuals to control sensitive information in a meaningful way, and they go into the system to get their disputes resolved. Let me just shut up, because I've been going on a little too long. But um, that's the trick. I mean, we have to have the information public. We can do a much, 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 much better job at getting it public. And we also have to protect the sensitive information. It's easier said than done, but we need to muddle through. Um, so I'm normally the person at Berkeley who's wearing, who usually wears a suit, and my colleagues are always complaining to me, asking me to wear jeans. But I now have a little baby, and I can't afford to wear any more suits. <laughs> um, I, I just was in the bathroom, and I realized I have two stains on this shirt. Um, the other day, I was at some. Um, it's a badge of honor. Yeah, it's a badge of honor. I was at. I went. I had some convenience store or something, and the woman behind the counter was laughing at me. And I, didn't quite understand it. When I got home, I had a sock on me. <laughs> so that, that's the reason why I'm dressing like a bum lately. I apologize to all of you uh, um, for that. But I also wanted to thank Carl for including me in this wonderful uh, program and for reaching out uh, and for reaching out to me uh, on some of these privacy issues that you have um, uncovered and, I, and tried to deal with uh, quite conscientiously. I, I think you've been uh, extraordinarily careful and uh, thoughtful about uh, some of the problems that you you run into um, in trying to bring more transparency to these systems and to make them more usable. Peter Wynn's article is definitely worth checking out because uh, as I think you were summing this up at the end. Um, he points out pretty clearly that where the courts and where the actors in the court want privacy, they get it. They can't they focus on it, you get it. Um, and a lot of what we are dealing with in the privacy world generally um, is the problem of ex externalities. Uh, people who are perhaps not even party to the suit, for some reason their information is in it, or people who are disempowered in the system, their information is, is in the system, and people who are more powerful want to keep it um, uh, public for reasons. Um, another kind of uh, uh, interesting point you made was the idea of will, will lawyers try these different rules. Um, that's a, a really interesting point. Um, one of my students just completed a survey of the rules in all 50 um, states of how to file a court case with a pseudonym. Um, and one of the reasons why we worked on this article was that we found that many of the lawyers who were doing privacy court cases did not know the option was available to them. And they might have read, um, I, I, I actually, some of them I talked to, they didn't realize like Jane Roe of Roe versus Wade. They didn't realize that <laughs> Jane Roe of Roe. Yeah. Um, and if you, I think if you look at that case, the yeah. court on its own substituted. Sarah yeah, Jane Hughes. Yeah, su yeah. substituted uh, Roe. Or the District of Texas. So, yeah. it, was not, um, it was not a movement of the parties, as I understand it. It was the judge. Um, it was the judge. And so will the lawyers try it? Well, they gotta know that these remedies are available and, um, and 
so because so many privacy suits happen in state court, we thought we'd write the state survey, and, um, and that should be coming up um, uh, this fall. Um, so I wanted to throw out some thoughts about this issue generally. And one thing to think about in considering the, the public records problem or the court records problem is that there's many different types of government records that are subject to different rules. Um, and even where there are very strong rules, there are still massive problems. Um, one area to look at um, uh, in particular is, uh, let's say, the Driver's Privacy Protection Act. So um, federal law now limits how Department of Motor Vehicles can limit personal, the release of personal information um, uh, about individuals. Um, it came about because, of, among other things, there was a woman stabbed to death by a stalker uh, here in California whose uh, location was determined by a private investigator with access to the DMV. There, um, actually almost all the victims are women, um, uh, you know, women driving down the street and someone says, oh, she's pretty, and writes down her license plate and can go buy her home address for like a dollar. That was also um, available, uh, an available uh, practice back then. And then um, the, uh, the anti-abortion activists would sit outside clinics, write down license plate numbers, and figure out the home addresses of individuals. This all led, um, in, in particular, uh, California um, um, senators uh, to push for a very strong law uh, limiting the disclosure of driver records. Um, and one of the reasons why that law could come about is that advocates could show that a problem existed. They could go get audit logs. They could go find out that it was the private investigator who showed up at the DMV and checked out the personal information about the victim, etc. cetera. Um, that could drive the documentation of the problem, drove the legislative intervention. And one of the problems we have in public records is that there's no way to prove there's a problem. So we can speculate about um, stalking, um, we can speculate about identity theft. I actually doubt there's a lot of identity theft going on through public records, but for a different reason. But we ultimately cannot link the uh, problem uh, uh, back to the architecture that we have in court records. But even where you do prove that there's a problem and you pass a statute, um, lots of um, interesting things happen in that process. Uh, when you look at the Driver's Privacy Protection Act, for instance, um, it protects your your record at the DMV, but it does not protect records outside the DMV. So when you walk to the rental car uh, company and you give them their dri your driver's license, they are free to scan it. And in fact, a lot of them do. And then they send it to a cooperative database run by a company called ChoicePoint. Um, and so they literally scan it and they lift your picture and all the data off of it. Now, is that a violation of the Driver's Privacy Protection Act? No. Um, the courts look at that and say, that's not a motor vehicle record, number one. Number two, you voluntarily did that. You voluntarily surrendered your license to that company. Um, you see the same, same problem with swiping. If you go to a bar or you buy alcohol, in most states, the, the, the company that is, you're buying um, alcohol from can swipe your license and keep all the data that is in the uh, track. Um, and then, you know, when you go to the airport and um, you notice that there, your car is greatly illuminated when you pull into the parking lot, well, that's because they're doing uh, plate recognition. Um, uh, wouldn't it make sense to sell that data? Why wouldn't you sell that data? It's outside of DPPA. There's a lot of people who pay you a lot of money for it. Um, so um, one challenge is, is that even when you enter a kind of a, con a command and control type regulatory regime, People still find ways uh, to get around um, uh, collection uh, restraints. Another um, big challenge one has in this area is, is unmasking the type of the liberal ends that are presented as um, liberal arguments. Okay, so this is kind of a confusing way of saying that the people who are most interested in creating Big Brother in the US, and I'm not kidding about that, they think it's a normative good to have a Big Brother system are gonna come in under the mantle of the First Amendment and transparent government um, to, to get access to personal information in government records. So the kind of, uh, the, the, the original purpose of a lot of these records is to oversee the government, um, but they will come in using that language in order to get personal information out of those, um, uh, out of those coffers. So um, you have, um, 
kind of a circular lobbying uh, where um, on one hand, uh, various companies that are very good at uh, getting data out of the government, personal information out of the government, will say, we, we don't implicate privacy by our practices because we only collect public records. And they go to the next office and they say, the social security numbers, they should be in the public record. So they, they enlarge the scope of the public record and then argue that the enlargement no longer covers anything that's private. Um, and you can see this in a lot of different uh, uh, articulations of the strategy. Uh, one example is that in the, in the model legislation proposed by uh, data companies, um, they want to make it so that a company cannot be liable for ever disclosing information in a public record. Now that sounds reasonable, okay? Um, but it also means that if a newspaper chooses to publish a birth announcement that includes your mother's maiden name and your date of birth, that is a public record, there cannot, if your bank later leaks that information, there can be no right of action. Um, it also means that if I wanted to do something pretty perverse, I could create a newspaper and just publish everyone's social security number. Not sure federal law would prohibit that, um, and then it would everyone's social security number would be in the public record, etc. Uh, let me try to move on kind of quickly. Um, in, in the background of all these challenges, there's a greater uh, there's a growing number of people who want to recategorize information that people that is not considered private right now as private. So the home address, Peter and I were talking about home address um, uh, uh, yesterday. Um, that's actually a uh, piece of information that is becoming sensitive in, in a strange way. Um, California law now allows many public officials to uh, call up data brokers and say, don't sell my home address anymore. If you're a police officer, if you're a judge, prosecutor, legislator, etc., cetera, um, and shield your home address um, and a lot of that is being driven, I think, by a, a problem of that Peter mentioned, uh, the problem of self-help. Um, we have kind of a growing factionalization in the US um, where more and more people are dealing with political problems by showing up at your house. And you can't kind of know if you're gonna be in the uh, category of people who are gonna be visited. Um, uh, just an example at Berkeley, if you're an animal rights researcher, that's the new kind of category of person who has to think carefully about um, their uh, home address um, because uh, a researcher at Santa Cruz house was burned down by um, an animal rights activist and another family was attacked in their home. Um, so both on the left and the right, we're seeing this kind of um, the, uh, basically use of, of public directories uh, and, uh, to, to show people's homes. And you can't kind of foresee if you're ever going to be in um, a, uh, a category uh, of person who's gonna be a victim of that type of uh, activism. Um, so with all this said, um, there are great examples of um, government data that can be used uh, or, uh, to look at what the government is doing instead of what its citizens are doing. Um, uh, one example is uh, David Burnham's Transactional Records Access Clearinghouse. Have any of you heard of that? It's known as TRAC. Okay, TRAC, wonderful service. It tracks what the government actually does. It's uh, pretty incredible if you subscribe to their um, email list. Um, you'll see that, um, sorry, but the Department of Justice will say that they're doing this or that, and David Burnham will say, uh, you know, actually they're not really doing um, or they might say they might be saying that they're doing that, but they're doing it in such a way that it's not really accomplishing the, the end. Picky, it, picky, it, picky. It, <laughs> um, the, the, I mean, the most recent one is identity theft. You know, identity theft prosecutions up when you when you dig under. It, it's really just prosecutions of undocumented workers, not financial fraudsters. Um, so th there are examples of where uh, uh, government data can be this data can be leveraged to, to look at what the government is doing without kind of creating a panopticon of, 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 of what individuals are doing. And many of the solutions in this area um, can create really strange outcomes. Peter mentioned some of them. There are some private uh, privacy advocates who are suggesting, let's just publish all social security numbers. Okay, I mean, the problem, the problem we have in social security 
world is it's used as both the password and an identifier by banks. It's used as both. So if we published them all, um, perhaps they'd stop doing that. <laughs> perhaps we could remove some of the harm from, uh, from inadvertent disclosures of the SSN. That's, I mean, on the range of solutions, you hear arguments like that. Um, I explained some of the problems with, uh, uh, with kind of a command and control regulatory approach. Uh, somewhere in the middle, you might say, well, let's limit the presence of unique identifiers in public records. There, that creates an interesting problem in itself, uh, because then you can't disambiguate citizens. Mm -hmm. And um, a, a related problem in this field is it's now becoming just as jurors can kind of do a background check on the fly of, of, um, of a potential de of a defendant, um, employers can do kind of a fly-by-night uh, background check by, by using a search engine. And if you can't disambiguate one Peter Wynn from another, you might think that this Peter Wynn is the, you know, whatever, um, someone who's been arrested or convicted of something. Um, and maybe the Peter Wynn that filed a lawsuit against his employer three or four years ago. Um, you know. And so we have this loop, loop, interesting loophole in our background check law that allows employers to do self-background checks in an unregulated fashion. But if you hire someone, you have to follow all sorts of, of, of rules. So we're in this strange position now where it's become very easy to do a self-background check. Uh, but even if you have a name as strange as mine, there are three Chris Hofnagels in, in the US. Um, you could very easily uh, see that the disambiguation problem. Um, finally, let me, um, let, let me just mention that one of the kind of strange outcomes of, of uh, all this data uh, out there is, is that I think governments could start to think that they are creating a strategic disadvantage for their own citizens by making it so transparent. So if you live in a state like Florida, which is posting you know, mugshots of people who are merely arrested, you're basically creating a great database of people who are gonna have problems getting jobs forever. And um, uh, they're gonna have problems getting jobs relative to people in other states. At the University of California, um, our UCPD, our police department, they actually publish the full text of their activity law, meaning that students that they arrest ends up on the internet. Um, even if I call in, let's say, a noise violation on Peter, it will say noise violation regarding Peter Wynn, complainant, Chris Oknall. Wouldn't you like to Google that and come see me sometime? A little self-help. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I would hope that institutions would realize that, you know, that's, that in the long run, in the short run, it might be pretty rewarding yeah. to punish these people well, this yeah. way. But in the long run, yeah. UC is going to suffer from such a policy. Well, the other, there's two things that are going on. You know, I don't, I mean, I don't want to interrupt, but there's, there's one of the things, I, Carl, when, when Carl identified violations of the rules of the federal system that you, know, you weren't supposed to file social security numbers, and I think you, you sent letters, I think, to each uh, clerk or each chief judge in, in the individual districts where you found the violations. What was interesting is ha what happened at that point is the lawyers that had filed those pleadings were immediately contacted by the clerks and then they, they took steps to remedy the problem by, by correcting the pleadings and the offending pleadings were taken offline and so forth. So I don't think it's as simple as to say it's, it's more public information will necessarily hurt privacy. Under certain circumstances, you can have a feedback loop where more public information will enhance privacy, okay? Because if, if, if the system, an adversary system, is not identifying the violations of privacy for people who aren't really being represented, whether it's the public or individuals who don't have lawyers in the system, which is where the problems, a lot of the problems show up, then having public auditable databases could potentially be part of the solution of the privacy problem as well. Okay, so this is a complex, what you get is complex counterintuitive um, information back when you're, when you set up an information feedback loop. Likewise, you know, Chris is saying individual, you know, we don't like the word panopticon, but the panopticon effect is precisely the effect 
that should take place with respect to government information because the citizens want people like me thinking that we're always being watched, so we'll behave, right? That's what Bentham said. In fact, Bentham's Panopticon was initially, you know, parliamentary proceedings in England were confidential. And Bentham single-handedly led the charge to get parliament, parliamentary debates where you could talk about them in public in the newspaper, okay? So, so it's, information is a really complex animal a good example is, okay, so who's a rat.com is a, is a website that isn't bulk data. It's a wiki site where people are basically just uploading information about cooperating co-defendants and undercover law enforcement officers, um, largely to encourage self-help in prisons or, or to prevent you know, people who might be about to buy some dope from an, or sell some dope to an undercover law officer. Um, what happened is when that website became a concern for the judges, they started taking plea agreements offline So, because a lot of the information about the cooperating co-defendants' activities would come up in their, uh, pre in their, um, you know, their sentencing um, process, the sentencing plea. It's, a, it's a, a plea agreement and a factual resume. The factual resume would largely summarize the assistance that the that the defendant who's going to be sentenced is provided that allowed the prosecution of these other, other individuals. Well, if that is up online in a convenient way, the guy's going to get whacked in prison. Okay? So what, what the response was to take that and just not file it. Okay? So the, 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 the really interesting thing about how the sentence was adjudicated was, was in the plea agreement, but you don't see the plea agreement in the public record anymore. You have to make a FOIA request to the U.S. Attorney's Office to get it, okay? Now, that is a terrible solution. I mean, I don't, this is really not DOJ a, a policy, but, but it, the, the plea agreement is what we need to make sure the judges and the prosecutors are behaving themselves and are not giving sweet deals to the alderman's son, right? Um, that's what has to be, that's a critical, judicial record that needs to be in the public domain, all right? So, so simple, these simple things of just pull, I mean, what's gonna happen as more and more horror stories happen is they're gonna pull stuff offline so it will no longer be subject to public oversight. And that's gonna be a tragedy. So, so we, we have to come up with, with a better information management structure than, than either don't file it or let everything go online because there will be consequences that are going to be negative. Um, Chris also said rules don't solve problems. He's absolutely right. We have terrific rules. We got this rule that I thought was terrific anyway, and nobody's using it. Because it, it's just not, it's not, it's not something that exists in the paper world. So people aren't comfortable trying it out. So they don't, okay? Um, the habits of a generation take two or three generations to, to, to change in terms of behavior. And behavior is probably the biggest problem here. Um, the, um, and then, you know, the, the issue that I think is, from a legal point of view, probably the most interesting, maybe it ultimately won't matter, is this notion of downstream controls. You know, I argue that maybe the PACER website should have a site license that says you should only use this for legitimate purposes and you shouldn't use it to, like, whack people. Right? <laughs> um, um, you know, and but and I thought, well, why don't we at least say that? You know, <laughs> I'll defend the constitutionality of that side license. Um, but but Carl, really, and, and Steve Schultz and a couple of other people just beat the living stuffings out of me because the practical problems of doing that are just mind-boggling. Um, the downs, the idea of downs, I mean, the idea of taking, you know, anybody who, who accesses information on a site, like, on, on a PACER system or any court system, and saying, well, you have, to, you have to adhere to the Fair Credit Reporting Act. You know, well, maybe we could do that with bulk data users like Westlaw and Lexus. You know, at least maybe with the, if, if we corrected the Social Security numbers that inadvertently got filed in pleading and they've, you know, they've, they've gone in and, and, and downloaded it all and it's up in their system, they probably should clean it up too. But 
I don't think that that alone is going to, you know, just having rules sort of creating downstream responsibility, even if it's restricted to, da to, to data miners or, or bulk data users. I don't think that's, I think you can defend it legally, but as a practical problem, I don't necessarily think it's going to solve all the issues. Um, but I think we just need to keep an open mind about various solutions. Um, and by the way, there's this really interesting rule that you ought to try if you're in litigation. By the way, I'm fully in favor of the anti-wacky EULA. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Uh, that we've talked Can we hold it for 30 seconds? Okay. Well, thank you. All right, we'll just take a moment. And then we'll do a five minute wrap up, and then after that, we're simply going to do closing comments, and um, then we'll be done. We'll get you out of here at 3 o'clock. <laughs>